Whether you call it Kvake, Kvik, or Kvike, there's no denying that this unique Norwegian yeast has had a remarkable impact on the brewing scene, and Imperial Yeast's A43 Loki is one of the best versions out there. With the ability to produce a clean beer when fermented as warm as 104 degrees Fahrenheit or 40 degrees Celsius, you heard that right, while also performing well at more standard ale temperatures, Imperial Yeast A43 Loki is as versatile as it gets, meaning you have zero excuses for failing to brew throughout the year. Learn more about A43 Loki at imperialyeast.com and grab a pouch for your next batch to see what all the fuss is about. On its own, beer is pretty awesome. It tastes really good. It makes you feel pretty good. There are tons of styles to choose from, so drinking never really gets that boring. And it has the odd ability to bring people together. It's this last point that ultimately led to brewers and beer lovers organizing various events that would allow them to commune with like-minded others in person. This is the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and I'm joined by Will Lovell this week to chat about our experiences with various brewing and beer events. Yeah, so what greater way to come together than to get with, you know, a few hundred other people around the simple beverage known as beer and socialize and have that ultimate social lubricant and interaction with others. It's a great topic to talk about the various uh, fests and events that we've been to. So I'm really excited to chat about this today. As am I. And except for a couple small local events that happen to be held at breweries, I really only started attending actual events around the time Brewlosophy got off the ground. Admittedly, it was because I finished grad school, started a career, so I had a little bit more time, a little bit more money, but also because that's when the obsession really kicked in for me. Now, since then, I've had some pretty rad opportunities to attend events around the world, and I know you've participated in some cool ones as well, Will. I look forward to not only chatting about our experiences at these events, but going over some of the differences between them. All righty, if you enjoy this show and would like us to keep producing it, please consider becoming a patron of Brewlosophy over at patreon.com slash brewlosophy. By making a small monthly pledge, you'll receive rewards like access to unpublished contributor recipes, unique discounts at yakimavalleyhops.com, and an invitation to a monthly live Q&A session with somebody in the brewing world. Coming up in October of 2024, respected author and editor of All About Beer, as well as host of the excellent Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast, John Hall will be hanging out with patrons. It's likely everyone listening to this show is familiar with John's incredible work, and if his name happens to be unfamiliar, go check out the All About Beer website and his Drink Beer, Think Beer podcast. John has a lot of experience with over 20 years reporting on the beer industry and interviewing some very well-known folks. I've no doubt this is going to be a fun session. To be part of it, be sure to make your pledge of just $3 or more by Friday, October 18th, as John's going to be taking questions on Saturday the 19th. All past sessions are stored on our private Patreon and Facebook pages, so patrons can go back and watch them whenever they like. Learn more about all of the rewards we offer for your support and become a patron today over at patreon.com com slash brewlosophy. Another really easy way to help us out is by using the links found at brewlosophy.com slash support. When you're shopping online, your experience doesn't change at all, and we get a little kickback for the referral. A huge thanks to everybody who has made the effort to help us out in this way already. Feedback is brought to you by Clawhammer Supply, who offer brewers various options for high-quality, reasonably priced electric brewing rigs in various voltages and sizes. I've used their 120-volt system for 5-gallon batches, as well as their 240-volt 10-gallon setup, and both really are awesome. Clawhammer Hammer Supply really puts the effort into ensuring their systems do exactly as they're intended to do in as efficient a way as possible. And if you're not ready to make the jump to electric just yet, they also sell 10 and 20 gallon brew in a bag home brewing starter kits. Whatever it is you're looking for, do yourself a favor and visit clawhammersupply.com. We are confident you're going to love their stuff just as much as we do. Now, speaking of Clawhammer Supply, as many of you know, they are based out of Asheville, North Carolina, which was hit insanely hard by Hurricane Helene. Uh, I reached out to our friends at Clawhammer and received word that they are all safe, so we are insanely grateful for that. Also, they shared that their main warehouse is located in another state. Uh, it's in Tennessee that was not affected by the hurricane, so minimal disruptions to orders, shipping, and such. These dudes are doing really great things for home brewers, from developing awesome gear to producing killer YouTube content. If you have it in you to give them some love, I'm certain they would greatly appreciate it. 
All right, listener Wayne Edgton wrote in with some feedback after listening to our recent Brews Views episode on bread and barbecue. Get ready for this one, Will. Wayne said, as an avid brewer and baker, I listened to your most recent podcast with great interest. I'm now back in Australia after living in Italy, Austria, and Germany for many years, and I like to research and follow their traditions for both brewing and baking. Over the years, I was fortunate to discuss techniques both old and new with brewers, bakers, and chefs from these countries. I like to bake mostly baguettes, focaccia, pizzas, and bezels. If not using sourdough, then their recipes call for using, quote, brewer's yeast. Traditionally, the bakers and pizza restaurants used to use yeast slurry from their local brewery, and bezels dough was often made with beer instead of water. Using this idea, I bake with 100% hydration starter using Weinstefan or wheat beer yeast collected from a German wheat beer that I brew about once every six weeks. Both the starter and baked goods have a wonderful yeasty flavor and aroma. As a fun fact, the yeast expert from the world's oldest brewery, Weinstefan in Munich, states that their recent genetic studies of their most iconic wheat beer yeast have shown that it is actually a Japanese sake yeast that they think came from research exchanges with Japan in the 50s and 60s. So Will, I really like this feedback. It's super interesting to me on many levels, but my one question to you as somebody who's lived in Germany, what is a bezel? I have no idea. Uh, I I don't know that I can recall what a bezels is. I'm about to hit the old Google machine and see if I can pull it up in the next 30 seconds. But I do find it interesting uh, that I think, I guess the first thing I would say is like, I was not aware that they would think that the uh, wheat beer yeast was a sake yeast. I do yeah. know that there is a lot of uh, beer yeast out there that are sac servicia is the same as what most bread yeast is. So they're kind of the same um, type of yeast. So it's not really that big of a reach for me to think that you would get your brewer's yeast to make bread with, especially if you had a big old slurry of it, it would probably go pretty fast. Um, I'm assuming. Uh, so that, that's a pretty cool idea. Um, but as far as the bezels, I'm not really sure. And my quick Google search didn't turn up anything worth talking about in this <laughs> segment. Uh, but, <laughs> but, um, you know, just to be perfectly candid, but yeah, I, I have no idea on that one, but I think it's really cool. Like I do like the idea of using brewer's yeast. I like the idea that he's using it from his own like home har- harvested yeast that he's making at home with his uh his his uh wheat beer that he's making at his house so that seems like a really cool idea a really great way to kind of uh go there i've i've used my wife's sourdough starter to make beer but i can't say that we've used any of my yeast slurries to make bread so maybe we need to like reciprocate here a little bit more in our household <laughs> well i i googled bezels as well and t- the only thing i could come up with when, when i did a google image search was it looks like pretzels so uh, maybe that's just a different term for pretzels or something but like you uh my my googling fell short so regardless I think it's awesome that there are people out there using yeast intended for beer to make bread with. I mean, we all know that packaged bread, like you said, Will, it is technically brewer's yeast, the stuff that you buy, you know, the, the, that Fleischmann's stuff at the store or whatever. Uh, but I think we all agree that there are qualitative differences between bread yeast and the, the yeast that we use to ferment beer. Uh, so I, I'd be fascinated to try using something like my sourdough starter to ferment a beer with. I'm also very neurotic. So that idea, it wasn't one that came easy to me. So that that's for the future, of course. I also love the idea of using beer in place of water. That is definitely something I think I'm going to be trying with an upcoming loaf of sourdough. Maybe in a side by side with a standard loaf, just replace the water with beer. Uh, I, I suppose I'd have to determine what type of you know what style of beer I want to use. I, I don't think like a hoppy IPA would be great, but who knows? Regardless, thank you so much for the email, Wayne. Very interesting stuff. If you have show feedback, you can send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com or drop us a note on social media. All right, it's time for a quick break. When we return, we're going to be discussing our experience with brewing and beer events. Chilling work can be a chore, especially after a long brew day, but not with the Exchillerator Counterflow Chiller, which can chill a 5-gallon or 19-liter batch of wort in 5 minutes or less, leading to a strong cold break and clearer wort in the fermenter. Brewlosophy's Matt Del Fiaco uses the Exchillerator Max and absolutely loves it. In addition to improved chilling efficiency, every Exchillerator comes with a 5-year warranty that covers the entire chiller for manufacturer defects. If you're looking to up your chilling game and a CFC is right for you, head over to Exchillerator.com today. 
There's no denying that stainless steel is the best material for brewing equipment, and Delta Brewing Systems offers some of the lowest prices on high-quality stainless gear, like the Firm Tank, which in addition to holding 8 gallons or 30 liters of work, comes with a domed lid to even further reduce the chances of a messy blow-off. Plus, it can hold up to 4 PSI of pressure for closed transfers. Delta Brewing Systems also has their own line of brew kettles as well as one of the lowest-priced all-in-one electric brewing systems out there, and their prices are shockingly low. If you're in the market for legit stainless gear that won't break the bank, do yourself a favor and head over to DeltaBrewingSystems.com today. Well, you've done it. You got the kids back to school. You sorted the uniforms and named enough things for a small army. No rest for the wicked, though. It's a new year and a new routine of juggling it all. Well, maybe we can help. You can now get your Dunn store shop delivered same day by those lovely people at Buy Me. Just order your same day delivery straight from the Dunn store's app. What's more, delivery on your first four orders is free. Don't forget it's swimming lessons tomorrow. Minimum spend 30 euro. Selected delivery areas only. Subject to availability. IT and business consulting's best kept secret is no longer a secret. I like to work. I really love my job here. The problem solving aspect of our job is just, it's exactly what I want to be doing with my life. You're a person, a whole person that has interests, that has family. In addition to, you know, the work that you're doing professionally. There's no way that I would be able to manage growing in my career and, and raising a young family if I did not have that flexibility. As long as you're willing to do the work, anything is possible. Find your perfect role and thrive at CGI. Visit CGI.com slash women. I'll never forget a conversation I had with Michael Tonsmeyer prior to attending my first homebrew con in 2015, back when it was still called the National Homebrewers Conference. I'm not sure if it was on social media or over email, but I asked him about the level of drinking that occurs at these events, and he said something along the lines of, well, by the time you get home, you're not going to want to touch a beer for at least a week. Now, without question, the sheer volume of beer available at these types of brewing and beer events is, well, it, it is a lot, and while that absolutely absolutely contributes to a kick-ass time. It can also lead to some issues. We're going to break down our experiences attending specific events in the next segment, but I thought we'd start by more generally discussing the, uh, let's call it the art of navigating brewing and beer events. Go ahead, Will. So um, I always think the first thing you should always look into is kind of a no before you go kind of scenario. It's definitely good to get on a website, get on an event, get some insider information from your friends on Reddit and like kind of get an idea about what this event is about. Cause some of them are like, you know, a homebrew con or some of them are like brewery anniversaries. Um, I've, I've had events where this brewery is normally dog and kid friendly, but for this special event, they may not be dog and kid friendly or maybe they become super dog and kid friendly. So just kind of know before you go. And then I also think the big thing to know before you go is the solid exit strategy so are you going to be staying at a hotel next to the brewery are you staying uh, or next to the event are you staying down the street are you staying down a metro line are you taking a lift or an uber like i think the exit strategy is the ultimate no before you go know how you're getting there know how you're getting home especially if you plan on taking it a touch too far well i'll tell you the, the, it's funny because i wasn't planning on on hitting on this piece of it but in order for some people and i i'm not really one of them i i don't really experience FOMO too much, the whole fear of missing out thing. But boy, do I have friends who really do. If if you don't want to exit early, if you don't want to ghost, as it were, uh, then and and develop like will like you're saying, develop this this kind of planned exit strategy. Then you need. Then this is the next point on my list. You need to learn how to pace yourself at these events. Uh, and by that I mean you're going to show up, and there's going to be all of these beers. And and for me, from the psychological perspective, even I to this day, you know, 20 years into this brewing thing, I still experience this fear that they're, they're going to like run out of all the good beer, right? And so I got to go get that now. Well, I'm still, you know, I'm, I'm only got a four ounce pour. So now I want to go try all these other beers that maybe aren't so popular. Next thing you know, you've been there at a 10 hour event for two hours and you're wasted. You know, you've got to know how to pace yourself. And I think part of knowing before you go, as you mentioned, Will, is understanding just how many beers are going to be there. If you're really going to be a nerd about it and you want to try all of the overhyped beers, then maybe 
maybe plan out your strategy to, to be waiting in lines and you, you know, you have your, whoever you went with, whether it's your spouse or girlfriend, boyfriend, you know, friend of yours, whatever, they can go wait in the line while you're getting yours and you guys can share sips of each other's if it's really about trying and then that will reduce your alcohol intake as well. These are all little tricks that I've kind of learned. I'm not saying I've fully adopted all of them, but uh, over the years that I've been attending these events. Well, and if you're going with someone, speaking of like, how do you even buy beer? Sometimes you have to get tickets. Sometimes you only get so many tokens and you have to go buy more tokens. Uh, one of my favorite events here in town is a beer run where you go after the run and you get all unlimited samples. Like there are no tickets. You just kind of go wherever you want and get whatever you want. And so kind of no. sometimes you got to pay cash like over a counter and they don't take credit cards. So know <laughs> how it is that you're going to pay for these things as well. That's that's a pretty big deal. If you have the FOMO, it's it's hard. To, to go above the three tokens you get with the cost of entry uh, if, if you can't quite do that, if, if they do do that. Because some places you just sit down and you pay a ludicrous amount of money for a beer. So oh, yeah. it's hard to say. Um, I, I would also say in the middle of this, stay really hydrated. Uh, we talked about this in the hangover episode, but you know, alternating beer with water sometimes is a very, very uh, legitimate way to pace yourself and to also kind of keep yourself on the up and up for not having a really bad day the next day. <laughs> I, I learned a trick my at that, that very first uh, homebrew con that I went to. And it was they, they you know, a lot of these events will give you like a, a, a tasting glass that's printed with their logo and such as kind of a gift. Uh, and if you take that, it's usually four to six ounce tasting glass, whatever whatever shape it might be in. If you just tell yourself that, and there's water machines everywhere around, whether it's a fountain or like a, a some sort of a you know a, a, I don't know water jug type of deal. If you drink a beer and then you go and you tell yourself, well, I, I don't you know I don't want to blend that beer with the next beer that I'm going to taste, so I'll just go rinse my glass out. It might not sound great. You don't really notice it though. If you rinse out your glass and drink the rinse water, well, every time you have a beer, you're going to have some water as well. And for me, that is the easiest way to remember to pace myself uh, is, hey, I just finished this. Let me go find some water real quick and then I'll come back and have another beer. And and in my mind, there's a couple of things that come with that. One, I'm matching the alcohol intake with water. That's always a good thing. But two, you're also filling up your stomach a little bit more. We talked about this in the hangover episode as well, that, that as your stomach becomes more full, it's, diffi- it's more difficult you know, or less appealing, I should say, to continue adding more to it. Yeah, 100%. So just keep, keep that water coming in. And then as always, it's not a bad idea to eat during these things. And now it depends on where you're at. I don't know what the food situation was like at HomebrewCon, but some of the festivals I went to in Germany and Europe in general, like some of the best part was the food that was there. And so you're really missing out if you're not going out and having like a, a nice roasted chicken at Oktoberfest along with a big stupid pretzel that you and your whole family can split. <laughs> so so really, like, like honestly, you... you eating at some of these events is just as much fun as the drinking. So, you know, and it's a great way to keep from getting so, you know, wasted that you can still kind of participate as the uh, day goes on. Yeah, absolutely. Now, here's one that I think some people view as controversial and I don't quite understand why. Uh, but it's it's I, 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 I'm referring to them as supplements, but they're not even really that. So when I go to beer events, I always pack a little baggie with uh, Vivran pills like Vivran tablets. Uh, and I'll also throw in some L-theanine. Now, L-theanine is used by folks. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm a psychologist. I don't do meds, anything like that. But uh, caffeine and L-theanine, when you blend them, I've read that it can really, uh, you could take the caffeine, it'll wake you up. The L-theanine helps to take the edge off of those jitters. And so I've been doing that for over 10 years when I go to drinking events. And it, for me, it really does help. Now, I don't have any issues with caffeine. I don't view it as being this evil thing. Uh, so I've, I've seen people when I pull them out or they're, they're starting to get a little bit tired. I'm like, hey, you want a Vibrin? And they're like, what is that, man? Meanwhile, while they're the ones who are off, you know, again, over consuming alcohol, like, uh, you know, where, where are your anyways? Uh, and so those are those are two things that I always carry with me when I go to these events. And I again, I find them really helpful. Uh, I'm usually not taking them right off the bat. It's kind of my way of regassing my engines, you know, um, and and it and it works well for me. Another little trick that I, I got into about four years ago, my brother in law, uh, he and I both were struggling with some, you know, uh, as you age, you have some issues with your gut and whatnot. And he introduced me to the idea of daily Metamucil. And I know that sounds weird, but all it is is fiber. And my God, it's life changing. If you have any issues at all, especially when you're drinking beer or certain types of food, 
you know, two little glasses of Metamucil a day and I am, I, it's changed my life. Well, it also helps as a kind of a byproduct. It also helps to fill up your stomach a little bit and make overconsumption way less appealing. So that's a little, a, a little thing that I've been using. You can buy it in powder form and mix it into like a, like a tang type of drink, or you can buy it in capsule form, which I, that's usually what I'll be taking with me on trips is I just take a big bottle of the capsules and take five of those caps every morning and, and then off to the races I go. And I find it insanely helpful uh, to, to have that in my stomach when I go into these drinking events. I, I just want to point out, if you're not used to taking Metamucil, you may want to ease yourself in before you get to the five capsules because that stuff can, it takes a little bit of getting used to. So unless you want to like <laughs> give you some, some, some non uh, emergency emergencies, that's what I would recommend. But <laughs> I never um, had issues. I, I will say this. I, I, I heard that warning. I got it. And I, I took all the care in the world to make sure that I was, you know, in the right place at the right time. Uh, I never had any issues from, from the get go. It was, it worked out perfect for me. So I, I, when I, when I haven't taken in a while, I have to ease back into it, not to get too personal here. Um, and I would say, uh, I think, I think a good substitute for the Vivarin, uh, caffeine pills. Like I know what you're saying, trying to stay awake, but they also have the liquid IV powder that has caffeine in yeah. it now. Yeah. So you can get one. your electrolytes and your, uh, caffeine all in the same kind of thing so that's kind of a, a a buy one get one free like two in one kind of thing there so that's pretty amazing yeah and and hopefully you do all these to prevent some of those worst case scenarios right because you don't want to be the guy that's passed out drunk in a corner throwing up in the bushes or the you know not to say that i haven't been the guy that's passed out drunk in a corner or the one that was throwing <laughs> up in the bushes because uh, at some point in time, I have been that guy, but strive to do better than that. Strive to be better than me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I can't tell you. So I don't typically, I'm usually like a, a day drinker. So I try to get out before the late night crazies. But every time you're out late night and you see that guy in the corner that just, you know, that he's like inches away from death and his buddies are just keeping him there. Yeah. Barely. You're like, oh man, I just feel so bad for you guy. Like your buddies just need to take you home and they're not going to because they're having too good of a time. That, and that's exactly it is is you have to realize, I mean, there's a level of responsibility. I know some drinkers don't like that word, but in going to these things and making sure that you don't, one, don't make a fool of yourself because when you do, you're usually going to ruin the event for the, either the people who came with you or the people who just don't want to see you act like a fool. So, you know, know how to handle yourself at these places. So those are our main considerations when it comes to preparing for an event like this and kind of managing yourself when you show up to them. But there are some other things you have to keep in mind when you go to these events. Obviously, if it is an event, there are going to be other people there. And kind of the way we were talking about that, that drunk guy puking in the corner, uh, you, you have to be okay, or at least open to, to witnessing some things there. Uh, I, I'll never forget. I was, I, I went down to the, we'll talk a little bit about this more in, in the next segment, but I went down to Southern California, uh, home brew fest a few years ago, and I was walking around with Andy who ended up joining the brewlosophy crew uh, after this, in fact, uh, but he organized the event, uh, Andy Carter, uh, with the California, um, uh, Home Brewers Association, and we're the beautiful event, right? Uh, again, I'll, I'll say more later, but you're down there at this cool campground, and everybody's just walking around having a good time. And you know those like blow up dinosaur uh, dolls that people can like get into and run around, and it's like there's like a there's like a fan that keeps it inflated. Yeah, it keeps it inflated. It's like the inflated dinosaur guy that's got like the little claws you run around. Yeah, yeah. So so we're all, this is an out, outdoor event. It was beautiful outside, and we see this dinosaur running around, and people are laughing having a good time it's middle of the day everybody's already you know one and a half to two sheets to the wind and next thing you know i witnessed the whole thing as as many people did this larger dude just takes on a full like linebacker run at this person and just tackles the dinosaur takes takes him to the ground now nobody at this point knows who's in the dinosaur costume right they un they unzip the sh the, the dinosaur doesn't get up. They unzip it. And it's this, you know, kind of smaller framed female who is just absolutely traumatized by this event. Thankfully, the guy got walked out of the event, had to leave. They forced him to leave because you just don't do that. But I mean, was he was he inebriated? There, there were all the signs point to yes. And it's that kind of stuff that can be a huge, obviously damper on these events. Think before you act, as my mom used to always tell me. Marshall, think before you act, buddy. Because if you don't, you're going to ruin not only the event for yourself, but for other people as well. Yeah, that, that sounds 
incredibly terrible, especially for that poor person that was just bringing some sparks of joy running around in a dino costume, not hurting anybody. <laughs> it was funny. And somebody just yeah. decides to decides to be a, kind of a, a jerk, and and you don't you kind of wonder what goes through their head. But obviously they've been drinking, so uh, you know the bottle didn't make them do it, but it probably just let them. So uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing that I've seen that's kind of you know gross a little bit is you know you see the two people maybe maybe they're there with their date maybe they're met someone at the event and they're getting a little bit too much uh frisky pda going <laughs> yeah. on and a little frisky and maybe a little bit of fun in the bushes and you know what don't don't be that couple don't be that guy get a hotel find a room um lock yourself needs- in a porta potty do something so that we do don't s- have <laughs> <laughs> yeah we don't we don't need to see that trust me yeah. we don't need to see it so please just go 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 keep all that intimacy to yourself please <laughs> <laughs> and I, I think we've all seen it, and uh, I, I don't normally appreciate it. Although it is fun to people watch it sometimes. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm not. Yeah, I, I, I will, I will look and be like, "What the hell are they thinking right now?" And usually, the alcohol is is doing most of the thinking. Another one is just. I mean, I guess we've kind of hit on it, but it's just general like being inconsiderate. I'll, again, another another story. Uh, when when I was at HomebrewCon in Baltimore, we had set up this. Uh, this area in the expo to collect data for experiments. That's kind of what we do. We'd been announcing it. We were really excited uh, to have people, you know, fans of Brewlosophy be able to swing by and not only participate in an experiment and I believe a Hop Chronicles. We had it all set up. We'd been working all morning. We woke up early. We didn't, you know, tie one on too hard the night before, all because we were looking forward to doing this. And within five minutes, this 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 fella comes up and he has uh, like two friends of his are, are with him, uh, and both female. And they they kind of let him go up front first. And I I invited all three. No, you guys can all take it together. It's all good. And it started off, you know, cordial, and we're we're having this chat. And the his two friends are kind of struggling with the with the uh, uh, triangle test, and I'd explain to them, you know how we do this, Will. You know, take take the triangle test. Keep your thoughts to yourself, please. Definitely, when you're done, just turn around and walk away without saying anything. Well, we've got this these three people who are all standing in a row taking this test, and he he gets done, and I see him do it on his phone, you know. And I, I said, all right, thanks a lot, man. And he turns to, to both of his friends and he's like, come on, this is easy. I said, hey, if you could just just go ahead and go away. We don't want you to influence this. And, and oh, it's so easy. It's the green one. Come on, duh. Ha ha ha. And I actually, I, I don't get angry very, very easily. I slammed my hand down on the table in front of the guy because I knew he was drunk. And he, it like shook him real quick. He kind of start, got startled, looks at me in the eyes, you know, and, I, and I'm like, hey, I've asked you three times to leave. Can you get the hell out of here right now? This is not how this is supposed to work. And of course, now he's feeling ashamed and like, oh man, whatever. And, you know, I told his friends, I said, don't worry about it. You guys, you know, I, I actually deleted their data. I don't know if I told them that, but it's it's that kind of behavior where if you're going to an event that is focused on a specific thing in this case brewing and then you go and engage in something that that uh, you know attendees find meaningful don't ruin it for them you know be cool uh they're being cool with you they want to get you involved but don't don't be arrogant about it yeah and, and in the same token like i know some sometimes it's hard but uh offer a little bit of grace to those around you as well. It's kind of more about the tips and tricks of having the best time. But, you know, if somebody cuts you in line while you're standing in line and they're kind of drunk, then, you know, maybe it's just better to turn the other cheek and be like, whatever. This guy's obviously had a few too many. He's not being like angry and egregious. Uh, So, you know, obviously you were in a a poor situation where things weren't going right and you're trying to get some meaningful data. And and I I have that happen all the time as well, where somebody's like, Oh, well this is easy. And you're like, dude, just shut up. Just shut up. Yeah. Like if if you meet me, if you meet me out in the hall, I'll tell you the answer. But like, seriously, just like be quiet. Yeah. Uh, And so now I've actually trained most of my homebrew club pretty good now where um, if they want to know the answer, it's basically in the parking lot as I'm leaving that I'll tell them. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that's if they're like begging. I usually just keep my mouth shut, but you know, and I and I I think there's a there's people it, people are interesting. I mean, if there's one thing I've learned in my in my 20 years uh in in the whole psychology field, it's just that people are interesting, largely unpredictable as much as we'd like to think they are predictable. But there are certain certain things that we know work better. First off, anger is useless. You can argue with me that, about that all day long. Anger is always a secondary emotion. So if somebody comes and cuts in front of you in line and your immediate response is anger, you could probably use a little bit of help. Uh, but you could come up, flip the script a little bit, have a little bit of fun, make them laugh, make them real. You know, if both of you are laughing and having a drink, that's far better than, you know, somebody 
somebody getting busted in the nose for no, no, no real reason at all. So I agree with you on that one. And on that note, be sure to be social. When you go to these events, I mean, if you're going to anywhere, any sort of an event where there's other people there, I mean, if you're the type of person who likes to uh, sell yourself as being an introvert and you know you hate other people, then just stay home. Don't go to that event. Uh, it, it, you, again, you're going to bum people out uh, by by acting that way when they just want to have a good time with other people, other like minded folks, you know, who who enjoy beer and want to talk about it and and engage in all of the fun stuff that might be going on at the event. Be more inclusive, you know. Stop with the exclusivity stuff. If, invite folks in. I mean, Brewlosophy is relatively well known in the beer in the beer world. When we go to these events as Brewlosophy, there is no limit to how many people can come do stuff with us. It's not like you got you need a special invite. No, just come kick it with us. If you want to come down and have a beer at the bar, we'll let you know where we're at, you know? Um, and I feel like that really contributes to just that feeling of camaraderie among, again, like-minded people. So, I and I can't tell you how many great times I've had with just the random people I met at the beer hall, yeah. at the brewery, and just, like, had to share a table with them. Like, one of the best nights I've ever had, just, like, we met some random dude at this bar in Bruges, and we ended up, like, drinking with him the whole night, like, bar hopping. I can't tell you, like, how many times just having a nice little social interaction has turned into a really great blast with perfect strangers. So, obviously, be safe. Mind, mind your manners, your P's and Q's. Uh, but, you know... I it's a lot of fun just to meet some people, go hang out and just go have some drinks, especially, uh, you know, at various events. Yeah. And I, I have a, I have one story that kind of goes against that as an experience of myself and my wife, we were in Dublin, Ireland uh, again for a beer event that I'll talk about in the next segment. But, uh, she and I were just hanging out in Dublin, uh, one of the nights where we didn't have anything going on. And we were, we were kind of bar hopping, going around from different places. And at one of these bars, we, we, uh, met, we were sitting next to, uh, this gal and her boyfriend. We think he was her boyfriend. And he was from some Eastern European country. She was Irish. So he had flown out to like hang out with her uh, in Dublin. And so we just thought, cool, you know, two couples, we can hang out. And he goes, hey, last night we went to this really cool bar because they were closing things down. It was it was early in the morning, really. Uh, and they're closing things down. He goes, but this one bar is open till 4 a.m. Why don't we walk over there? Like, yeah, cool. It's, it's only less than a mile from our hotel. That sounds great. So we walk over to this bar. And as we're sitting in there, this dude starts to get super aggro like he he is like starting to get really angry at us for being American. And like Laura and I are like, oh, crap, what did we get ourselves into? And we ended up walk. He, he <laughs> it's kind of a funny story. He's like, oh, there's this other hotel that has a great bar that, that closes at three. It was only like two in the morning at this point. So Laura and I are like, yeah, yeah, that's on the way back to our hotel. It was the opposite direction of our hotel. So that was our our one little trick. Right. And as we're walking to the, we, we walk up to this hotel and he walks in and his girlfriend's left out. And my wife goes, Hey, you should go in. He's been in there for a minute. Why don't you go check on him? So she walks in and my wife and I hoof it. We, we like cut away from them, ran back the opposite direction. We just got scared, you know? And, and mind you, we, we had a few drinks. Neither of us were, were, you know, tripping over our feet or anything like that. But there are going to be things you just got to be cognizant of out in the world. We don't know that it was probably completely benign, not a big issue, but it made us feel skeevy and so we we took you know the effort to get ourselves out of that situation exit strategy bro exit strategy always exactly. gotta have one uh so another thing that i think is kind of important is like timing of your activities uh so so martin keen and i had this conversation a few days ago uh because i kind of told him we were going to be doing something like this this weekend uh chatting about this and and he said you know he reminded me of a time that he was at folks fest which is the second largest beer festival in the world in stuttgart and he had a few beers and then went and did the carnival rides because it all whether it's Oktoberfest, folks Fest, lots of these places have carnival rides and apparently after a few beers and a few carnival rides he was completely wrecked <laughs> the rest of the time <laughs> And, uh, you know, and carnival rides make me kind of nauseous anyway. So other than like the weird Ferris wheel that just goes up and down, like I don't usually do much in the way of carnival rides at some of these things just because they kind of have a tendency to wreck me anyways without the help of alcohol. But that's a really good point. Like if you're going to do an amusement ride, you might want to do it at the beginning of the night because later in the night it may seem like a good idea but trust me it is not no <laughs> it's an awful idea been there done that as well and for me i have to i have to like sit down and have something greasy like french fries or something for for a good 45 minutes before i feel 
you know, less queasy. Also, uh, and I'll, I'll just hit on this very briefly because I know that there are people out there who this might offend, but if you happen to engage in uh, the consumption of the cousin of hops while you're at these events, just be wary of being cross-faded. That's never a good look either. Uh, one of the big things that I like to, uh, that I enjoy about going to these events is they always, almost always at least, come with some form of a swag bag, uh, at least a paid event. You know, a, a lot of like the local Oktoberfest events and such you're going there just to just for the experience alone and, and still paying the same amounts and all that but if you go to you know things like homebrew con or other brewing conferences they usually do have some form of a swag bag don't forget that don't set it down and leave it alone in a corner because chances are you're not going to remember where you put it and now you're out all the cool you know fun stuff that are in these swag bags uh, usually also it's in that swag bag where you're going to get your tasting glass which not only serves as a nice memory of it you know in the future but it's what you're using to drink, you know, all of the wonderful beer that's at these events. Uh, speaking of which, Dick Wallace, I still have your roadmap anniversary cup. I'll get it to you soon. <laughs> Hopefully, you get it by the time this gets published. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> yeah, God. Oh, Dick, come on. You got to remember to grab your glasses, Dick. Uh, the the yeah, other <laughs> he, he totally left it in a corner. My wife's like, "Who's is this?" I'm like, "Ah, that's Dick's. Okay, I'll get it to him." <laughs> Another one uh, that that I think is a good point, and something that I've really, I think, gotten a lot of value out of uh, at very the various events that I've attended is usually there will be you know a group of people or multiple groups of people who are organizing these kind of beer share type things. Um, I think one of the most notable ones would be Milk the Funk, um, you know, the the funky and sour beer uh, brewing group that that I believe was founded on Facebook originally. Um, at every homebrew con, they organize a real Really cool. I don't know how it's going to go this year, of course, but they organize a really cool meetup where everybody brings some of their, you know, funky, sour, wild beers and shares them. And then at the end, usually there will be somebody, I think from Bootleg Biology, it might be Jeff Mello uh, hanging out, but be, he'll, will like collect all of those dregs. And then I believe they've put out like a, like a strain before that was with this or somebody did something like that. But regardless, the, the, the ability, the, the, it's so fun for me to sit and taste what other people are creating uh, and to share what you've created with them as well and and to kind of geek out on that. So don't don't be shy, you know, make sure you go to these these events. Most of the time you don't even have to sign up. You can just walk into them and whip out some bottles and you're you'll be welcomed with warm arms. Yeah, bottle shares are a great activity and a great way to share beers that you made and enjoy or and then maybe beers that you didn't make but still enjoy. So that's awesome. And then another thing to do is participate in some of the other activities that are there. Like, you know, if there's a, a fairground, go travel the fair. Like if you're in some place that's actually nice and historical, like if you went to Munich for Oktoberfest, for instance, make sure to make time either around the festival or during the festival to go check out some of the cool sites, some of the cool things to go see. Um, you know, if perhaps you're at a spot where they're doing karaoke, go join in and watch Marshall sing karaoke if he's there, uh, you know, games, different things. So make sure to participate in all these activities. And these will go a long way to help you do all these things, socialize, pace yourself, and really just experience like overall the, the greater enjoyment of the event. Absolutely. And there, there are these events out there, uh, obviously, that are maybe bigger than other ones and last longer, whether it's over a couple of days, over a weekend. If they're putting on events, if they're, you know, it, what makes the event fun is when people engage in those activities. It's when we all get to, and and the fact, here's the thing. We all know that, that you know, beer is a social lubricant, as all alcohol is, but we also know that we can fall back on the fact that we were drinking to explain our silly behavior. So that's okay. If you if, if you don't usually get up on the stage and sing, you know, uh, uh, Don't Stop Believing by Journey, well, have a, have a beer. Then you can say, like, I don't know if I'd have done that if I wasn't drinking, but it was a lot of fun when I did it. And, that, and, and it, again, like, I, that to me is part of the that one of the funnest parts of a lot of these events so uh we've got to cut to a short break when we come back we're going to be shifting the focus to our experiences at specific brewing and beer events Are you tired of wasting beer by taking gravity measurements with too much sample volume? We've all been there. Well, the Easy Dens and Smart Ref combo by Anton Parr is your perfect solution. These smart tools provide precise wort and alcohol content measurements and track fermentation with minimal sample volume. Easily connect to your smartphone and log data in real time through the Brewmeister app. Visit EasyDens.com today and use code BRU15 for 15% off. That's Brew15 to get 15% off your order. 
After a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste more time chilling wort. I've tried so many different options, and ultimately, I settled on the super efficient immersion chillers made by Jaded Brewing. With the King Cobra and Hydra, I'm able to chill my entire batch of wort from boiling to just a few degrees above groundwater temperature in as little as six minutes. If an immersion chiller is right for your brewery, then do yourself a favor and check out all of the rad options Jaded Brewing has to offer at jadedbrewing.com. And be sure to let them know Brewlosophy sent you. As every brewer knows, the best beer requires the best hops, which Yakima Valley Hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world, carrying everything from classics like Cascade to modern favorites like Galaxy and Mosaic, as well as other ingredients and gear, Yakima Valley Hops has it all. And don't forget to check out their new podcast, The Late Edition, where the YVH crew goes into depth on our favorite plant with industry experts. Head over to yakimavalleyhops.com now to see all they have to offer and subscribe to The Late Edition wherever it is you listen to podcasts. IT and business consulting's best kept secret is no longer a secret. I like to work. I really love my job here. The problem solving aspect of our job is just, it's exactly what I want to be doing with my life. You're a person, a whole person that has interests, that has family, in addition to, you know, the work that you're doing professionally. There's no way that I would be able to manage growing in my career and, and raising a young family if I did not have that flexibility. As long as you're willing to do the work, anything is possible. Find your perfect role and thrive at CGI. Visit CGI.com slash women. As craft beer exploded in popularity, many of the incredible breweries we've all come to love began putting on annual events that often sell out quickly and involve a full day, sometimes multiple days, of rubbing elbows with brewing superstars, communing with fellow beer lovers and home brewers, and of course, drinking tons of delicious beer. Similarly, with the rise in homebrewing, communities all over the world began organizing events specifically for homebrewers. Will, you and I have had the opportunity to attend a smattering of these events. The experiences of I which of which I imagine are mostly positive, though perhaps some that were less so. Now, before we jump into this, I just want to make a point to say that it is not our intention to diss any of these events, but rather speak candidly about our experiences at them. All right, Will, uh, what event are you going to start us off with? So I'm going to be counter to what we've just talked about. I'm going to start with the world's largest wine festival in Bad Durkheim, Germany. It's in the rhineland Falls region, and they call it Verstmarkt, which literally translates to sausage market, which doesn't make a lot of sense for a wine festival in Europe, but apparently this thing started as a sausage market in Bad Durkheim and then uh, expanded into a wine fest. And this is uh, definitely one of those where you want to know before you go, because uh, most of the wine is going to be Riesling, and you can order it in like Trocken, which is dry, Hobtrocken, which is semi-dry, and then Susa, which is sweet. And when you order a glass of wine at this event they will give you basically like a half liter uh it looks like a dimpled shaker pint of of wine so that's 500 milliliters of wine uh extra credit marshall if you know how big a bottle of wine typically is oh um, i i don't I it's don't. about 750 50 milliliters <laughs> i thought so, it was so a trick drinking, question man <laughs> you're drinking two-thirds of a bottle of wine in this one glass and so kind of the insider trick here uh it's a really pretty town it's really cool it's nestled in the middle of the wine country of the the rhineland faults and so like it has one of those really cool like swings where you go up like 100 foot in the air and it spins you around and you can like see the vineyards that are surrounding like this beautiful town in this picturesque spot in germany um but the real trick is in order to keep yourself from going off the rails in about 30 minutes because trust me i've seen a lot of americans because it's not too far uh from kaiser slaughter which is where a lot of americans live with the military uh but but you'll see them ordering wine because they refuse to order vine shorla which a vine shorla is where you mix sparkling water with wine half and half and i really kind of enjoy a dry riesling with half um sparkling water like it's a to me it's a very refreshing drink especially if it's warm outside And it also keeps you from going off the rails in the first 30 seconds because I can't tell you how many Americans I've seen just stumbling around, barely able to walk because this is a place where pacing yourself and knowing what's going on before you go is super important because if you don't, you will be falling over yourself like (laughs) crazy. Um, But again, uh, and then another one is it's one that you don't want to drive to. uh, So having your entry and exit strategy is pretty pretty solid like either i think one year we took a a bus trip there uh through some organization where they would drive you there and back the problem with the bus is that 
you would go and people that you didn't know were on the bus with you and they would be taking up the bathroom the whole way back because they didn't pace themselves. <laughs> uh, I believe the bus driver charged a hundred euro to any person that puked on his bus. Uh, and that, that was the cost. Like if you puked on the bus instantly a hundred euro. And so you're like, okay, well I can't, can't quite do this. Uh, and, and it was a, but it's also like a fairly quick train ride from, from Kaiser Slotten where we were near to. So, um, it, it had some tents uh, and a lot of food, probably not as grandiose as, as Oktoberfest. Lots of carnival rides, carnival games, lots of live music. It really is just a blast of a festival. Um, and even though we we're a beer show, I thought I would start off with a wine fest because, again, it really is just a truly great time that happens in the beginning of September in Germany. It sounds awesome, and I, I would absolutely love to attend. Like you alluded to, though, I mean, you go from drinking 5 to 7% on average ABV beers to drinking 13 to 14% wines. I mean, talk about needing to pace yourself, my word. Uh, and especially when they serve it to you in such huge vessels. I mean, come on. And then you mentioning the swing. Oh, God, that's a recipe for disaster for me. I get dizzy so easily already. So to mi- mix that with booze, oh. Uh, but it sounds like an absolute blast, and I've never heard of mi- I don't I've never heard of mixing wine with sparkling water. But it sounds like a pretty good idea when you think about you know if you cut it fifty fifty that you still have a seven percent uh, tasty little drink. I'm gonna have to try that soon. I always keep sparkling water on tap. So you're hydrating, and it's delicious, man. That's all I'll say. Yeah, it, it's. I mean, I, I'm gonna have to try it next time I have wine in the house. It's not something my wife and I regularly buy, but every once in a while I'll pick some up. I'm definitely gonna give it a shot. Now the first event I want to focus on, and and I got to get a disclaimer out there. I am not ordering these in any way uh, for like favorites or, or least favorite or anything like that. It's just what came to my mind first when I was writing my notes down. But the first one I want to talk about is the New Zealand Homebrewers Conference. Uh, I had the absolute uh, pleasure of attending back in 2017 along with Gordon Strong and Michael Tonsmeyer. This event, I mean, first off, getting to New Zealand is, it's a haul. We were 19 hours in the air, and that was with only, what, two flights, I believe? Uh, it, it is just a long flight, so you got you to gotta deal with that kind of a thing. But if you live, you know, uh, uh, down under, as it were, and, and you have, you're a brewer and you haven't attended this event, it is, in my opinion, it is so worth it. They have it organized over four days, I believe, and you can actually pay for each one of these days differently, if I, if I recall correctly. So the first day uh, was hop tours. We actually went out to New Zealand hops. Uh, They're the ones who process hops. Uh, Then from there, we went to Mac hops, which is New Zealand's largest hop grower. And then we also got to hang out for for a bit at the New Zealand hop research station where they do all kinds of testing on these hops. Absolutely awesome. Uh, uh, You know, you're completely immersed in the world of, you know, New Zealand hops. And it was super enlightening, very fun. Rubbing hops is always fun. So that was the start of that one. The second day is what they call brew mania. And it's, it's their, uh, I would say it's their, it's their like big homebrew competition, but it is judged in one of the most unique ways. Uh, it's not like a BJCP sanctioned, you know, competition here in the States or, or anywhere else. Uh, rather, everybody who submits beer judges everybody else's beers. So it's kind of this big round table thing. Uh, I can't remember the mechanics of the judging fully, but I remember thinking, wow, this is unique. It's a lot of fun. It's again, it's, it's a far cry from what we do with the BJCP, but a ton of fun. And I remember I was sitting there with Gordon Strong, who, you know, you know what he's known for is the BJCP. And uh, yeah, you know, in chats with him about this, this very non BJCP way of judging was a lot of fun. Uh, and then on day three, they have what's called March Fest. And this is just your classic beer and music festival, bunch of live bands playing uh, live brewing. I got to brew uh, with a New Zealand home brewer, as did Mike and Gordon. And then they actually those three beers went into a competition for themselves, which Mike Tonsmeyer one they did a really nice sour beer uh, for theirs so that was a lot of fun and and you know again that is that's the day where you're really kind of pacing yourself and making sure you don't you know you're eating on time and that you're drinking water and all of that and then the final day is the actual conference it's the homebrew conference where uh, we all all the guests got to give their talks up on a stage in front of you know what was it five six hundred people and then we had breakout sessions where attendees participated uh, at least with me in a live experiment where we focused on biased I actually had a local brewer 
brewer ahead of time make 10 gallons of Kolsch. He split them between two kegs and then one was dosed with Cinnamar, which is purported to have no flavor or aroma impact while the other was left alone. So basically identical beers. One was dark, one was, was light. And then we had people evaluate those beers both side by side. And then we had uh, a small group of people actually leave the room while they were doing, the others were doing the evaluation. And then when they came back in, they had no idea what the variable was. We blindfolded them, like actually blindfolded them and had them taste them. And, uh, and then they got to talk about their experiences when they didn't see the beers. So a lot of fun. These events can, can really add a lot of enriching experiences, I think, for anybody who attends. Dude, that sounds absolutely amazing. I just, uh, I, I want to walk through hop fields anyway. So to go through some of those New Zealand hop fields with some of the cool varieties they have down there and get to kind of experience that firsthand sounds like a once in a lifetime kind of thing. Yeah, it's amazing. And and the, the cool thing about most of these events, I think if you really want to attend, it's kind of like HomebrewCon. In fact, a lot of the guys who organized, and I think the, the three main organizers, in fact, the year after I was there with Mike and Gordon, uh, they attended HomebrewCon. And I'm pretty sure they're open to having people come out and attend there, uh, the NZHC as well. You just have to sign up like anybody else and then figure out a way to get down there. But it, absolutely worth it. If, you, if you're into beer the way we are and uh, you, know, you want to have have these international experiences and see literally the other side of the world and the way they do things down there. It is so, so worth it. Dude, that sounds amazing. So um, I think it's cool that you're going more of a home brewing st- route this this <laughs> way. And then I'm kind of going more like uh, general, less home brewery. So it's kind of a cool little mix and match here. I like it so far. Um, so I'm going to hop into uh, kind of I, I, brewery anniversary parties in general, uh, but two of my favorite ones here, they're local and I'm just going to kind of highlight them because they're the ones I probably go to the most. Um, but every year I like to go to real ale, which is in Blanco, Texas. It's, it's a little under an hour for me. And then roadmap, which is a local San Antonio brewery. Um, but, but real ale is definitely one of my favorites to attend. This is one where it definitely pays to know before you go, especially if you have a family because it's super family friendly. Like it has like face painting for the kids. It has balloon animals. They have this really great outdoor space with a stage and they have like three to four bands playing the entire time. And some of them are like bands you actually want to see sometimes. Uh, I don't know. Probably nobody on this show has ever heard of Shiny Ribs, but I'm a huge Shiny Ribs fan. I, I appreciate everything Kevin Russell does out of Austin. And so it's just cool to see him on stage. And it's one of those where they give you like three to four tokens. Uh, but this last year, they kept having these like cask tappings that happened randomly and you didn't need a token for the cask tappings. So even though you only got like three tokens, I still got like five or six beers for the cost of entry. Cause you could just walk up and get this cool cast scale of like a pale ale dry hop with Phoenix hops or some other, uh, you know, random beer that they dry hop to something else. And it was super cool to just, to have all that for free out there, uh, that they would just randomly come out with this cask and just tap it right there in front of everybody. And again, it's over in Blanco, Texas. The live music's great. The little town is great just to hang out with and go walk around the downtown a little bit. It's a cute little town and just a great one. And then I'm mentioning a roadmap here as well, because kind of where roadmap is normally during the week, very family friendly, very dog friendly, like very open to all that stuff for the anniversary party. They are not like they, they come out and say, uh, we normally love all these people, but for this one, no, this is an adult party. There's not enough space, uh, to, to house your kids and your dogs too. So, um, so this, is where knowing the rules ahead of time is very helpful. Um, roadmaps very similar where you get the cup and they give you the tokens. Um, but you know, again, distance is a big thing. So real ale, I'm taking my family. I really have to pace myself. I really have to kind of pay attention to what I'm doing. So I don't like go over the top roadmap. I straight up took a lift there straight up took a lift home. I met my buddy Dick who I'm currently ransoming his roadmap anniversary glass. Uh, you know, so I met, met him there and we, we hung out and drank a lot of beer. So just especially for these kind of like localized anniversary parties, like it, it's really cool. So you, you know what they do during the week normally. So really kind of try to dial in on what they're going to do for this anniversary party. That way you can go maximize the time you're going to have and figure out if it's something that you want to take your family to, or maybe just go meet up with a friend. Yeah, dude, I love, I love the local stuff for many reasons. One, they're usually just a day, so it's not like you're, you know, dropping cash on a hotel or anything like that. Uh, two, a, a quick Uber only costs, you know, 
eight to fifteen dollars, at least where I live, and you don't have to worry about driving home. You can just let loose, have a good time. Don't be stupid, of course. Uh, I do the same thing with Crow and Wolf, uh, House of Pendragon. Unfortunately, House of Pendragon's tap room, where they used to host a lot of the events, is no longer there. So they're now down in Sanger, which uh, an Uber down there would cost probably forty dollars. So I, I haven't been able to make it down there as much lately. Uh, but Crow and Wolf, you know, their anniversary party, same thing. Their Oktoberfest events are always a blast. I, I was out of town this year when they hosted it, unfortunately, but I've been to all of the other ones. Yeah, I agree. They're so much fun. Usually they're putting on other events. There's live music that you're going to meet all of your friends that maybe you haven't seen from be- in the beer and brewing worlds, you know, in, in years, you know, they all show up to these things. So ton of fun. Um, the next event that I want to focus on, I already mentioned it a little bit in the first segment is, is the uh, Southern California or SoCal Homebrewers Fest. I attended this one in 2017 with Drew Beecham. We were, we were the two guests that uh, were invited to come and speak there. This is one of the more unique uh, brewing, home brewing in particular events that I've ever attended in part because it's held at a campground where the attendees of the event actually stay throughout the event. I think it's a two night, so three day, two night event. Um, People bring their tents, they bring their trailers and they mount up. And so you're, it's, it's almost like you're camping, but with this adjacent beer event that's over in a field and one of the unique aspects of it is it apparently was actually, it's down in Temecula, California, which is most people will recognize as being kind of a wine region. Uh, it was actually started by, I believe, the Chalurzo family. So Vinny Chalurzo's parents, I believe, were integral in setting up the SoCal Homebrewers Fest. And it's an ongoing event that I believe Andy may still be involved in planning So much fun. Several booths are set up around the perimeter of this field that's kind of away from the campground, but a very quick walk. It's like two minute walk. And all of these booths are serving beer uh, and you can just go around anytime you want. There'll be live music there. Somebody giving a talk up at a stage uh, and then you, you know, you'll be chatting with friends and Hey, let's go try the beer from this homebrew club. Here's the, the unique thing about it. I'm not sure if out of staters can attend or I'm, I'm, I would imagine they can if they want to pay for it, but anybody in California can attend this. And it's a really cool excuse to make your way down to a part of the state that a lot of people don't really, you know, may not, may not have experience in to make Temecula is absolutely beautiful. They have some good, I believe there's a Ballast Point Brewery there uh, that you can go hang out in and then you get to go camp and and commune with other home brewers in a, in a really unique way uh, compared to other events. That sounds absolutely amazing. Um, I know some of the members of the brew club uh, live in SoCal and so they actually go to this homebrew fest like every year and they're posting up pictures all the time on the, the Discord and the Facebook. And so it looks like an absolutely amazing time just to go hang out in a field and drink homebrewed beer sounds sounds like what what else could you want in life right yeah it's awesome man super fun so um i'm gonna kind of uh again lean back into some european experiences just because i think they're fun to talk about but one of my favorite places in the world is uh bruges or in the flemish brugge uh belgium and so uh, that kind of leads me into the the brugge beer fest and we can also talk about the the zythos beer fest which is in lufen as well because they're kind of a very similar format and and these are in in uh, belgium and you know, when I think of beer fest in Europe, I'm always thinking of the the other big ones in Germany. Um, but when you look at the Belgian ones, they're a little bit more like uh, traditional U- U.S. beer fest, where you go in, you buy the ticket, you get the taster glass, you get tickets or tokens, whatever it is, and then you're actually walking around kind of a big convention hall. Um, but the difference is, is that if you're a Belgian nerd, it's so much better because you have all this amazing Belgian beer from all these crazy Belgian breweries that you can just go walk up and try for for a token, um, and this is one of those where I think a big draw for both of these is the location. Uh, cause Bruges, I don't know how many people listening have been to Bruges, Belgium or not, but I have to say that it is one of the, the, my favorite places on planet earth. Um, they have canals with swans. If you've ever seen the movie in Bruges, you've probably remember them cussing all the canals and swans, but, uh, <laughs> but why would you do that? Uh, but they have, they have a, a, a bell fort. So the Belfry tower is there. Um, and there's nothing better in life and existing in Bruges, Belgium by having, um, mussels and fries on a canal, drinking some lovely Belgian beer. Uh, and then you throw a beer fest on the side of that and I am in heaven. Oh. So, uh, it, it's absolutely amazing. Again, it's more of a traditional, um, format like probably something you're more familiar with um with with american fest with the tickets and the taster glass but again uh even the food trucks they serve belgian fries which um 
are truly amazing. They are the best fries. They did invent fries, you know, in case people are wondering. And so that the Bel- <laughs> the Belgian frites are, are so good. And so you have to get those. Uh, uh, I think Zythos, which I talked about briefly, it's in, Lu- it was in Lufin when I went, um, and Lufin's, I think, a, a college town. I think it's the home of Stella Artois as well. Um, but they moved away from it, and I think it got canceled for 2024. So hopefully they get to come back in some shape, or, shape way, form, or fashion. But but both of those beer fests are absolutely amazing. And the Brugge Beer Fest actually happens in September as well. So you could potentially take a month off and go hit uh, the Versmarkt in Bad Durkheim and then Brugge Beer Fest and then maybe a couple other ones I might talk about here in a minute. Dude, that I feel like we're going back and forth making each other envious of, of the other, and that is not the intention by any means, but my God, that sounds so fun. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is, uh, yet again, another international event that I was very, very uh, uh, fortunate to be invited to attend as a guest speaker, and that's BrewCon, which was held in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, it's put on by the National Homebrew Club, I guess, j- just from my talking with them. Uh, the National Homebrew Club is Ireland's, you know, one national homebrew club. I'm sure there are breakout uh, clubs, you know, throughout the country, but they put on this amazing event that was so much fun. We, w- the year that we went, uh, I I was there. I attended with Ron Pattinson. We were both the guest speakers. This was 2019, so just months before the pandemic really hit. And I think we were there in October, uh, which as a lover of U2, particularly their October record, that was pretty magical for me. Uh, but uh, BrewCon is really neat. We we all met up at a brewery uh, called Rascals. Great beer uh, and, and phenomenal pizza as well, in fact. And I don't know, it was probably like 100 people, give or take. And, and they had a little stage set up in the actual brew pub. And they closed it off to the public. And we did our talks. And then we just got to kind of hang out. Um, we didn't do any data collection. You know, it was just me over there with my wife. Uh, so no data collection or anything like that. But then afterwards, we all kind of moved into the brewery. And I, I just remember having a really fun time learning about not even brewing culture necessarily, but just the different the kind of cultural perspectives from locals in Dublin. And then there were even some home brewers who came down from Northern Ireland. Uh, and that was fascinating hearing their stories and, and talking about the differences between, you know, Ireland and Northern Ireland and their thoughts on all of that. Like I, I get into that kind of stuff, uh, but it, just a really fun kind of a quaint, uh, you know, brewing homebrew conference type of deal that I felt was really enriching and just, just again, really, really eye opening uh, in terms of, uh, you know, brewers interests and their takes on approaching certain styles and such. Well, I, that sounds absolutely amazing anyways, because you're, you're going to Ireland. And so there's such a great, rich beer culture there. And then just to see how those international home brewers are approaching uh, this craft as well sounds like an absolutely amazing time and an absolutely great way to kind of like enrich uh, yourself with, with new ideas. Yeah, I, I loved it. I, I could see myself, you know, going back to that one. Same with the New Zealand Home Brewers Conference. That one requires a bit more time. And honestly, getting to Ireland is far easier and quicker than making it all the way to Australia or New Zealand. But yeah, again, and being there with Ron Pattinson, you know, he's kind of a legend in the brewing world with his historical documentation of, of beer styles and the things that I've learned from, you know, uh, uh, his his website uh, shut up about Barkley Perkins, uh, a phenomenal website. And so being there with him was also really cool. Yeah, just a just a phenomenal event. That's awesome. So um, I'm going to go to another international event, uh, perhaps not the one people are thinking of, but uh, in the year 1818, in the city of Stuttgart, you have Volksfest, uh, which is spelled with a V. The V is an F sound, in case you're wondering. And this is actually the second largest beer fest in the world, uh, only eclipsed by another one that happens to be in Germany. And what's cool is that this is an autumn celebration more than anything else. And it starts about the last weekend in September and goes on about for about three weeks in fall and does have an overlap with that other, uh, maybe the largest beer fest in Germany. Uh, so again, if you really, really wanted to, you could hit if you took the month of September off, you could hit some some bad Durkheim, you could hit a Brugge beer fest, you could hit a Volksfest, and maybe some other large festivals in Germany while you're at it. And uh, 
in Stuttgart and in Germany in general in the fall is quite lovely. There's all sorts of great leaf changes uh, here in here in San Antonio. The leaf change is kind of you go from green to brown really fast, and there's not a lot of color in the middle, but sometimes there is. Uh, <laughs> and so, but um, when we went uh, a couple of times, um, we went on some random Thursday, so we didn't need some of these these bigger. It has really big tents, similar to another one, uh, but we didn't need a ticket because we went on like a random Thursday. Again, we took the train uh, from Kaiser Kaiserslautern, which from uh, Kaiserslautern to Stuttgart is quite a train ride. But if you know that you're going to be drinking and things like that, it's not worth driving around in Germany uh, if you've been drinking, just because the, the rules are a little different. You're probably not going to be that good at, at drinking and driving there anyways, and they will take away your license and arrest you. So, um, <laughs> but, it, it, but, on, but on a random Thursday, it was a touch less crowded, and um, it was amazing. Again, they have really great carnival rides. This is where we talked about Martin Keene getting sick on one earlier in the segment. <laughs> so they have a lot of really great carnival rides, really great tents, lots of great live music, and the food is fantastic. So I... I think this place is totally on point. Uh, it gives you a very authentic German experience, uh, along with like not being quite as crowded and huge and, and overdone as maybe some other ones. Uh, it definitely, at least on the day that I went, felt less touristy like i felt like we were some of the only americans there uh which to me is always a good thing when you go places in in overseas and you're some of the only americans there uh maybe that's not a good thing for everyone but to me that always feels like a good thing and so i really just think this is a really great event and then also stuttgart is a pretty cool place in general if you don't make it there in the fall in the spring they also have a lovely uh frühlingsfest which just means spring festival and uh and so if you can catch it during their spring fest definitely hit it up there as well because again you have more uh, different beers but still a, a lovely experience in the city of stuttgart uh it sounds beautiful and and you know i'm i'm of the belief that you can go to an event and absolutely enjoy yourself. There's no denying that. But th there's something, for me at least, about having just that nice two-beer buzz that really, I feel just, again, it kind of opens me up to, to experiencing even the joy of these events even more and to be in you know countries like that. Even just walking around the Czech Republic last year with my family with a, with a fresh Pilsner Urkel in my hand. It's just like, man, this is what I wanted to experience. You know, This is the feeling that I'm after. And it's just, again, it's beautiful. Um, I, the next event I want to talk about, it's a unique one. And I'm not, I, I got to be honest, I'm not sure if Brew Your Own Magazine is, it has has come back to this yet? Uh, from they probably have, but uh, uh, from from COVID. But uh, in 2019, I was a guest at their BYO boot camp along with Denny Khan and Drew Beecham. Uh, we did a kind of combined uh, session, and it's a really this is another one of those really unique events that's really not like anything else I've ever attended because it is focused in my experience there at least, far more on the educational side of brewing than it is on uh, just having fun and a good time. That's definitely going to happen. But during the day, you actually sign up for these sessions and you go attend these sessions put on by mostly people who are fairly well known in the beer and brewing scene. Um, and, and you learn stuff in those. And usually there's some beer there to drink and whatnot. But it's not like you're walking around getting shit-faced right off the bat and then just having fun, you know, singing songs, dancing and doing all that other stuff. You're actually going and getting an education and then at night when the when the event is officially over or when that when that day's events are officially over, people are going out and around town. I happen to be uh, in Asheville, North Carolina, which was phenomenal. It was my first time ever going there, first and only so far. And what a beautiful city that is. Uh, we went around town with some locals and they showed us some really neat places. One of my favorite uh, places that we went to was this. I wish I could remember what it's called, but it was this whiskey bar that you had to pay a penny to get into. And apparently what they explained to me and they could have been pulling my chain here, but they explained to me that there was an old like like rule that was or law that was put into place back right after prohibition where you had to pay money to enter any sort of a, a liquor bar or something. And so so everybody just drops a penny in this pot and I guess they donated or something, but regard, it was so fun and you go in and it's just this old hardwood, you know, low lighting and you find a cool place to sit. It's like couches and old, you know, comfy chairs and they just have a bunch of whiskeys, a bunch of other types of liquor and all of these, you know, uh, 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 cocktails that are just handmade and 
absolutely delicious. We were there with, there was a good group of uh, probably six or seven of us, Cade Job, it's where I actually met Cade uh, from the Brew Lab for the very first time and he and I got to talking about him joining the crew was at the boot camp in 2019. Uh, again, Drew Beecham was hanging out with us, um, all bunch of other people. We had so much fun at this event and again, pair that fun with an educational component. You can't go wrong. That actually sounds like a really good time, especially with the BYO people. I know they do a lot of education, a lot of research and fund a lot of articles. So that sounds like a really great way to get educated and also go out and have a few drinks and a good buzz as well. Yeah. Yeah. It was a blast. It was a blast. Uh, did you have any other ones you wanted to talk about? Any other cool events or experiences at events that you wanted to bring up? So the last one I'll bring up is the granddaddy of them all that I went to, uh, Oh, I can't remember the year anymore, but it's the Vison or Oktoberfest, as you might know it, in 1810, when Ludwig I decided to get hitched with Teresa of Saxon Hildbrockhausen. Don't ask me to pronounce that again. They got hitched, and apparently they celebrated really, really hard and decided that the party was so amazing <laughs> that they had to bring it back every year. It's the granddaddy of all beer fests. Um, and I, I'm here to tell you, uh, it is very touristy, um, but there's a lot of like really awesome times there with all of the uh, the music with all the beer tents like if you can go online and look up the beer tents that they have there these are if you go during the the middle of you know summer like they may not they're they're building them like i don't, I don't even know why they tear them down because they look like very permanent structures if you had a tent like this it would be it would put glamping to shame basically because they are so beautiful and nice on the inside so great and rightly decorated uh, and some of the tents are like crazy so so basically uh, one thing to know is in order to get served beer at Oktoberfest, you have to be seated somewhere. You can't just like walk up to a, a booth or something and, and, you know, order a beer. You have to actually be sitting at a table, whether it's inside of a, a tent or inside of like the, or in the beer garden of that tent, you have to be sitting somewhere. Um, some of these places at different times require tickets. So like you have people that are ticketed that they get a big group and reserve a table. Uh, but there are also times where you don't have to be ticketed. Uh, so, the best thing I can say is if you don't have a ticket, go on like a random Wednesday, show up, and then just go. Usually, if you get there right about when they open at 10 or 11 in the morning, go sit down and you'll probably have the place to yourself on a random Wednesday. Uh, but it is so amazing. All the different options they have. Um, you know, you have all the, the six major breweries of Munich there. Uh, you have Augustiner, Lohenbrau, um, and I'll, I'm sure Polliner, and I'm sure I'll leave a few off. Uh, but you have all the six major breweries in Munich there. So you can pick a tent there, but then they also, and those breweries are all represented with their own tents, but then you have tents that are just like, they have like this oxen tent where they literally have this big, like beef oxen thing rotating on a spit. Oh. And you can order that from this big spit of roasting <laughs> oxen, which is, a, it's like really amazing and cool to look at. You should go look at it. They have like a fish tent of all things where they're like serving like all sorts of fish preparations, including like some of the fish is just like literally on a spike over a fire, getting like smoked or grilled, however you want to call that over a fire. And you can order a fish from there. They have a chicken tent where you can go order these roasted chickens and pretty much everywhere has pretzels as big as your head. So it, it really is quite an amazing experience. Uh, one of my favorite things is we went, uh, we actually, it, it is kid friendly before nine o'clock. Like they, after nine o'clock, they kick all the kids out. And trust me, you don't want to be there with your kid after about eight <laughs> o'clock anyway. It's like, don't do it. Uh, but there is a lovely fairground there as well. So um, we, we took our daughter was one. We had our daughter in Germany. And so we took her to Oktoberfest. And so we're there and Audrey's wearing her cute little dundle. My wife's wearing her cute little dundle. I'm wearing my later hosen. And, you know, you get a few liters in. And then all of a sudden I decide that we're going to go around and, and visit the fairgrounds because that's part of pacing yourself. Right. It's like, don't get totally trashed, which there it's very tempting just to like camp out at your table because if you lose your spot, you lose your spot. But at this point, we'd had enough where we probably didn't really need to drink that much more. And so, like, I'm going around and find these, like, shooting games. And, like, I'm I'm pretty inebriated at this point. And I'm hitting the things. And the guy says something to me. And I respond back. He's like, oh, Americans. Because <laughs> apparently, <laughs> drunk Americans can shoot better than most Germans. So, it's all good. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll stake that claim. Uh, and so, it was a lot of fun. But, but again, Munich is also just a great place to travel to. Uh, but this is definitely one of those places. Um, both times I've did Oktoberfest, I've done it twice. Once before I had kids and once after kids. And uh, I would definitely say staying someplace within... Um, 
at least cheap taxi distance, maybe metro distance, maybe walking distance are all really good plans for Oktoberfest. Uh, don't be the people sleeping in the bushes at the end of the night. That's kind of a little <laughs> bit because uh, they are there, uh, you know, so that that's kind of one of those things. But it is really just the mother of all uh, beer fest. It's a great time. And then Munich is just a beautiful city to walk around. And so make sure if you do go there for Oktoberfest, make sure to go to some of the other beer halls. Um not just the Hofbra house, which is very popular, uh, but, but go to some of the other like lesser known beer halls. Uh, some, you know, cause almost every beer hall is, you know, sponsored by one of the major breweries. And so just go to wherever you like the beer, sit down, have the beer and just go check out the whole city. Cause it's a beautiful place to stay. So I know a lot of people, obviously, who have attended Oktoberfest. Uh, I have not, uh, but I do have an, uh, a, an experience uh, around Munich that I will share here in a minute. But Oktoberfest sounds like a blast. One of the one of the things that I'm not a big fan of, and I, this surprises people when I tell them this, is that big crowds are very unappealing to me. It's not that it makes me anxious. They just feel really frenetic and it kind of exhausts me. Um, you, you know, you might be talking with somebody and then go grab a beer and then you don't find that person for hours afterwards because they get lost in the crowd. So, you know, I've I've had opportunities to attend Oktoberfest. We've talked about it, uh, you know, taking the family over there during that that season. And I just, I'm usually against it. But back in 2003, my wife and I, we were, it was the year before we got married. So my girlfriend at the time and I, uh, we did go on a five week, like backpacking trip in uh, Europe. And one of our stops was in Munich. I'm not sure how appropriate this story is, but I'm going to tell it anyways. Uh, our, our hostel at the time we were staying in this hostel and it was a very unique one where single rooms were shared by like 20 people and it was bunk beds. And when we showed up, all they had was room. They had two bottom bunks uh, or bottom beds on these bunks available. And so my wife and I, my, my girlfriend and I were like two beds apart, but both on the bottom bunk. No big deal. Uh, we didn't know who was, you know, on the f- filling the other beds because they were all out on the town when we showed up. So we end up, uh, you know, dropping our stuff off, whatever, and then going out. And it's probably like three or four o'clock in the afternoon going out and we find ourselves at the Hofbrau House uh, beer tent, right? And these things are up, at least the ones where we were in Munich are up all the time. Uh, and same deal, you had to sit down at a table and that's when you could order your drinks and they come in liters and it was awesome. So I feel like I got some of that experience without being in too big of a crowd. Well, while we were at that table, some people around our age, you know, we were in our early 20s, uh, were at the table with us. And lo and behold, we found out they were staying at the same hostel. So we kind of linked up with them. We're having a good time. And uh, we're talking about our experiences. They were from other European countries. We were the only Americans there. And I remember, you know, we got pretty lit when you're drinking liters of delicious Pilsner, you know, that's what's going to happen. And so we're walking back and I remember, I remember chatting with these folks. Nobody was falling over themselves or anything like that. We get back, everything's good, we go to bed. I wake up the next morning to a stench. And I and I'm like, what on earth is that smell? So before I do anything, you know, I'm checking myself, like did I really get that drunk? Thankfully it wasn't me. And I look over. At the time I was wearing those Teva sandals, you know, uh, and I, I whatever, I was they, they were comfortable back then for me. And I I had usually I would in a hostel, you take them off and you kind of push them under your bed, right? Well, in this case, I took them off and I left them just kind of hanging out from underneath my bed. And I look over and there is a pile of human feces on one of my sandals. This is not a joke. So my immediate thought was, I've got to document this. So I had an old camcorder that I brought with me and I've got this on video. Everyone's still asleep. Mind you, when I woke up that morning, these might be called youth hostels, but there was some like 70 year old dude doing calisthenics in his whitey tidies right in front of me. So I waited for him to leave. I get out of bed, I record this, and I kind of track the, well, let's just call them drops. And the dude above me who was sleeping above me had apparently hung his ass over the side of his bed and let loose. And so I, the rest of the trip, I, I had to go wash him off. I was able to get some really strong cleaner and soak my sandals and all of that. But we went down. This is, this is such a weird story, a memory I'll never forget. We went down to the, the folks who work at the host, hostel and I told them this story and I was like, We're, I don't, I'm not going to pay for this. I just, you know, and they didn't cave. And so we left Munich a day early because we didn't want to stay with the same people in the hostel room. Uh, We ended up in Venice, uh, Italy instead. But yeah, that's my one experience in Munich. We had an absolutely great time, but that was my don't drink too much because who knows what's going to (laughs) happen 
<laughs> in your hostel that night. That that is absolutely uh, gross. That Dude, is beyond. It gross. was oh. it, it, to this day. It blows my mind that that happened. But it, I have it documented. It's on video somewhere. Yeah. Anyways, I I would just say like if you want to avoid crowds again, going during the middle of the week and then like right when they open, like so if you're on like a Wednesday at a, at ten thirty or eleven, whatever time they open the tents, that's usually a good time to avoid crowds. Although sometimes it's kind of hard to predict. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I'm I'm all about avoiding crowds. And and the time we went with my daughter, we very intentionally went on a slow day, uh, just to kind of avoid some of that uh, craziness. Um, the the other fun story, and and then I'll cut it after this is like. Uh, you know, you got to go to the bathroom and not, you know, we were sitting in a beer garden, so it's kind of hard to get inside because they wouldn't let us inside to the tables inside uh, from the beer gardens outside. So I had to like go down the way to like a, a public toilet that's down there. And there's this like very attractive blonde woman, like directing traffic inside of this toilet, which is very common in Europe where you have somebody that sees over the toilet. Oh yeah. And at first you're like, you're like, Oh, I don't know what's going on. But then you were so happy. She was there. Cause she was like, when people drunk, people are done. She's pulling them out, pushing them out of the place <laughs> and then telling, telling the next guy where to stand. I'm like, man, if this woman was not here, I would have probably peed myself waiting in this line, <laughs> waiting in this line with all these drunk people because she's here though. She's like my, my uh, bathroom savior here. And so it, it yeah. was absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, to finish this up, I think we'd be remiss not to touch on uh, what is the United States' biggest homebrewing event, and that would be HomebrewCon. Uh, I attended in 2015, 16, 17, and 18. I haven't attended since. Uh, it is a really fun event. It's a great place to meet up with with other homebrewers, uh, folks that you've you know talked with online in certain forums, maybe on uh, you know uh, on Facebook, Reddit, stuff like that. Uh, it, they, they, it's a who knows. We've talked about this already, so I'm not going to believe labor this point. Who knows what HomebrewCon is going to become after this year with the changes that they made. But historically, you know, you're you're showing up, there's an expo every day. You can you can go attend uh, talks from various people throughout the day. You have to pick and choose because it might be that, you know, Will is giving a talk at the same time as Gordon Strong, which is giving who is giving a talk at the same time as say, you know, Drew Beecham or something like that. Uh, and so, you know, you have to kind of pick and choose what you wanna what you want to attend. But really all in all, it's a great time. Uh, the nighttime events are a lot of fun. They've got club night. They've got uh, all kinds of other stuff. So if, if you're local, if you're here in the United States, uh, or in you know close by, or you feel like flying out here, uh, make sure that you check to see what the conference is actually going to be that year. But it's also like I said, it's a ton, ton of fun. You get really cool swag and have a really good time. So have you, you haven't attended any homebrew cons, have you, Will? I have not, no. Yeah. It's something that I think we're going to see some changes to, uh, at least based on how they historically have been, uh, just because of the nature of uh, you know evolving interests and such. But uh, this year, it is he- being held at the Great American Beer Festival. We didn't touch on that. I've never attended. I have no interest in attending GABF. I don't know about you, Will, but HomebrewCon is just going to be a section of GABF this year. So I do look forward to hearing from some of our listeners about their experiences at that. But that is all the time we've got for our experiences at these brewing and beer events. Will, did you have any final words before we wrap this one up? I, I would just say whether it's local, abroad, whatever you're doing, I tend to, when I travel, drop everything I'm doing for the local fest. Um, I've definitely been to places where I walked into a festival that I was not expecting and still wound up just dropping what I was doing to go experience that festival. Because some of these, uh, especially regional festivals in Europe, they're only a certain time of year and you may not get a chance to experience it in that city ever again. So I'm really big into hitting whatever fest that you can and just enjoying whatever libations that may be local to them. You know, I'm, I've, I've often said that the best part about beer is the people, and I, I wholeheartedly believe that. And what better place to commune with folks who have similar interests as you, despite how different they might be in other realms of their world, than at beer and brewing events. If you have the opportunity, give it a shot, even if it's just something put on for a few hours by your local brewery or if you're traveling. I really do think it, they are enriching experiences that really help to keep that spark alive uh, for beer and brewing. Alrighty, don't forget to check out our new YouTube channel, The Brewlosophy Show, where host Martin Keen covers a bunch of fascinating topics in the world of brewing and beer. And remember to head over to brewlosophy.com to stay current on everything we are up to. 
The Brewlosophy Podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy Podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it soothes my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more. Life is good, the likelihood of me. Okay, it's official. We are very much in the final sprint to election day. And face it, between debates, polling releases, even court appearances, it can feel exhausting, even impossible, to keep up with. I'm Brad Milkey. I'm the host of Start Here, the daily podcast from ABC News. And every morning, my team and I get you caught up on the day's news in a quick, straightforward way that's easy to understand, with just enough context so you can listen, get it, and go on with your day. So, kickstart your morning. Start smart with Start Here and ABC News, because staying informed shouldn't feel overwhelming.